father and our mother are in this house right now. Can we celebrate our parents? Glory to God forevermore. Are you ready for the word this morning? You know, it's one thing to know the word, and it's another thing to be able to explain the word. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a father in this house who makes the word so clear to us. And the next voice you're going to be hearing in this house is the voice of our father. So everybody with your hands raised up in praise with Jesus joy. Let's receive our father to the microphone, Dr. Abel Thamina. Amen. to heaven father we rejoice that we are found in you complete in you like brother paul will say we know you or rather we are known by you revelation knowledge flows freely this morning but inside yokes are destroyed whatever is not planted by god is rooted out your people are built up equipped edified jesus is glorified and we rejoice that by the end of this service we'll all be the better for it in Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together. As we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Are we excited to fellowship in the word? Glory, 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 glory. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self. Let's get in the word. Uh, uh, uh. Mm. Whoa, it's been wonderful just spending time with us in Abuja and just enjoying Christ. Amen. And we're here. We're going to be here for quite a bit. So you'll get tired of seeing us. You better prepare. You better prepare to get tired of seeing us and seeing, us <laughs> and seeing our faces. <laughs> you know. Um, this weekend, we're not going to be here Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We'll only be in the, in the clusters on Wednesday. In the clusters, so we can take time in the clusters and digest all we have taught. You know, I have loaded with a lot of stuff, right? Last week and this week, we need to digest, chew on it, and fellowship around it, and discuss it among us, because that's part of growth. Then we are back on Sunday here. Sunday, we are back here for two services, okay? The, then, the, sorry, we are back on Sunday to our Ebenezer place for two services, then the other Sunday, the other Wednesday, we're in clusters. The other Sunday, we are back in a Benezer place. Then the other week, the third week, we are back here. And we'll be here Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The following week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Like that, like that, like that, like that. I didn't hear a good amen. I needed to clarify that so that everybody is on the same page with us. Amen. Second, I mean, the book of Luke chapter, Luke chapter 24, verse 25. I know you know where I was going. Second. Second what? Chapter. Verse. Luke 24. <laughs> oh, glory to God. On the way to Emmaus, Jesus was discussing with his disciples and uh, they were discussing the events of the past three days and they were saying, well, we thought he was the one that was going to restore political power to us. We thought he was the one that was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And even to make matters worse, the women that went to the tomb said when they went there, they didn't find the body. And then Jesus turned to them and said unto them, oh fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Observe the way Jesus taught beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. Now, it's important for you to know that you can never find God outside the confines of his word. The knowledge of God must be situated within the scriptures. Any knowledge of God outside the scriptures is not the accurate knowledge of God. So the knowledge of God must be situated within the scriptures. So that's why Jesus will begin from Moses and all the prophets to expound, to interpret unto them the things concerning himself. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. All shall know me. The knowledge of God is critical. All shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. Next verse. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. We've established that the Old Testament is Exodus to Malachi. That Genesis is the New Testament in a promise. That Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament. We also established this morning that the, 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 the four Gospels, the teaching ministry of Jesus in the four Gospels were not for the church. That the teaching ministry of Jesus in the four Gospels were limited. That Jesus in the four Gospels was the incarnate, the only begotten son, the monogenes, the only begotten son. We've also established that Jesus in the four Gospels was a man anointed by God, anointed by God. We have also established that Jesus in the four Gospels, his teaching ministry was limited. There are things he couldn't teach. There are things he couldn't say. And that's how we wrapped up the first service. John 16 verse number 12. John chapter 16 verse number 12. On the last teaching day of Jesus before his death, he now says to the disciples, after three and a half years of teaching, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all of the truth. For you shall not speak of yourself. But whatsoever you shall hear, that shall you speak. And he will show you things to come. Now in the first service, I took time to explain why I am reading what I am reading different from what you are seeing. So if you are not here, get the material of the first service. It will help you a lot. Now we also said that, that there was a reason why Jesus spoke in parables. Matthew chapter 13 verse 34. Matthew chapter 13 verse number 34. That the teaching ministry of Jesus was in parables. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. Without a parable spake he not unto them. So that means every time Jesus said something, it was a parable in the four gospels. Next verse, verse number 35. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. That word secret is the Greek word sigao. Sigao means it was kept from them. It was closed. It was kept from their understanding. Now, the next thing you want to ask is, why will Jesus be speaking to them in parables? Matthew chapter 13, verse number 10. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Look at the answer Jesus gave them. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. All right, next verse. For whosoever had to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever had not from him shall be taken away, even that he heard. Verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, 
and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Next verse. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. Next verse. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and shall understand with their heart, and shall be converted, and I shall heal them. So Jesus spoke in parables in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because he was speaking to an audience of unbelief. He was speaking to an audience, a people whose hearts were hardened. Which means the message he will speak to a people of unbelief will not be useful to the church. Because the church is not an audience of unbelief. The church is an audience of faith. Again, that is why the teachings of Jesus were not for the church. Are you here? That is why it was, they were not for the church. So Jesus used his parables because of the state of their hearts. Unto you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. So the key to know the parables of the kingdom of God is faith in Christ. The key is to know the parables of the kingdom is faith in Christ. Or to say, faith in Christ unlocks the parables of Jesus. Faith in Christ unlocks the parables or the teaching ministry of Jesus. You cannot have faith in Christ by reading the parables. You cannot have faith in Christ by reading the parables. Rather, faith in Christ will unlock the parables. The parables don't give you faith. But once you hear the message of faith in Christ, it's now easy for you to demystify the, the parables. And same thing Matthew will say in Matthew 13 verse 14. He said these people, look at it, Matthew 13 verse number 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. So when you believe, just like we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, see the way brother Paul puts it, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse, verse 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body also, also is Christ. Verse 13 now. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. So because you have drank into the spirit of Christ, you can now understand the parables of Christ. So faith in Christ unlocks the teachings of, of Jesus. So please pay attention now. Parables therefore expose the conditions of men's hearts. Parables expose the conditions of their hearts. Notice, for all the parables Jesus used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, John did not use parables. John did not use parables. John was different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Actually, John cheated Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know why? John rather wrote from Revelation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote from eyewitness. John wrote from Revelation. That's who, that is why John said nothing about Mary. Holy Mary, mother of God. John did not recognize her in his writings. Actually, he ignored her. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke were busy talking about the virgin birth, the angel came to Mary, Hail Mary, uh, you know, uh, uh, you shall carry a baby, how shall these things be seen, I know not a man, the power of the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, and you shall give birth to that baby, be it unto me according to thy word, and the word of God became flesh. While all of them were giving that kind of account, 
When John came on the scene, John just said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Case closed. No stories. Because John is not writing eyewitness, John is writing revelation. So John cheated the others. Because John's books are not parables. John's writings are not parables. John was not bothered about the parables. He was more concerned about the revelation that Jesus was seeking to communicate. Now listen carefully. John focused more on the last days of Jesus. Is the closest of the four gospels to the new covenant. The book of John. The closest. Because John wrote a lot from insight. What he had come to learn. Now, how many of you know that the four Gospels were not written until after the New Testament was written? So, history has it that when John wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the week he wrote those 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John was the week he wrote John, the Gospel of John. So, which means he wrote from the point of revelation while others were writing from the point of eyewitness. If it's getting clear, can I have a good amen? So it's important for you to know that because the book of John has the last days of Jesus' teaching. So he picked many relevant things in the life of Jesus for us in the new covenant. And they happened mostly towards the end of Jesus' life on earth. You discover that the other writers of the four gospels spoke mostly on the early days of Jesus and a few on the last days. But John wrote more on the last days than the early days. You know, while others were concerned with his birth, his mother, his brothers, the name of his town, Nazareth, and all of that, which is good for historical purposes. John just said, the word became flesh. Let's move on. He focused on the key things. But all of them are good stuff because they complement one another. Now, the key of the parables, the key of the parables, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, the parable of the sower is the chiefest of all parables. All the parables of Jesus put together, their chief is the parable of the sower. Now, let's look at it. Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Mark chapter 4, verse number 13. And he said unto them... Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? What he's saying is once you don't know this parable, you don't know anything Jesus said in the four gospels. Because he said nothing without a parable. So if all he said were parables, then he now says if you don't know this one, you will never know anything I said. So this parable is the chiefest of parables. Are we teaching good? Now, so this parable of Mark chapter 4 is the chiefest of all the parables of Jesus Christ. Now, so this is the key parable and it is called the parable of the sower. What is the parable of the sower? Mark chapter 4 verse 14. What is the parable of the sower? Can we all read together? It's almost like one sentence. Can we go one to go? The sower... No, 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 no. It looks like you people are meditating in the spirit while I am here preaching. Can I hear your voices like you are here with me? Want to go? So what does the sower sow? So money is not the seed. The word is the seed. The sower soweth the word. The so There's nowhere in the Bible where money is called a seed. It is the word that is the seed. From Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Right through the scriptures. The seed is always the word. The word is the seed. That's key. So the parables therefore. Explain circumstances and situations. Around the word. Around the word of God. It's not about persons and events. It's not the parables of Jesus are not about agriculture and the principles of commerce and economics. 
Because many pastors who call themselves business pastors, they teach their business principles from the parables. And others teach their agricultural principles from the parables. But you know you cannot use the parables of Jesus to write an economic exam. You will waste your school fees. You cannot use the parables of Jesus to start an agricultural enterprise. You will waste your money because the parables are not professional courses. So a pastor trying to use the Bible to teach economics has just insulted you. Or a pastor trying to use the Bible to teach you agriculture has just told you you are a fool. Because the Bible is not a material for teaching agriculture. Neither is it a material for teaching business. The Bible has a mission and a message. It reveals the Christ. Who is Christ? The savior of the world. So what is the message of the Bible? Salvation. Is it clear? You don't teach. Even marriage in the Bible is not a teaching on marriage. The teaching of marriage in the Bible is the revelation of Christ and the church. Where marriage is used as a parable to communicate Christ and the church. Because after Paul's finished talking about husband love your wife, wife submit to your husband, blah, 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 blah. He said, but this is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I'm not speaking about husband and wife. I'm speaking Christ and the church. But there are lessons from Christ and the church that husband and wives can learn. You're not answering me well. Looks like you like marriage seminars. <laughs> glory to God. I say glory to God. Alright, so the parables have a major parable, which is the parable of the sower. So now, he says the word is the seed. The key to all parables. Now remember, we know that Jesus used parables for an unbelieving audience. Which means the parables expose the conditions of the hearts of men. But for believers, Jesus never used parables. You know, every time he uses parables, he will call his disciples aside and explain. But to the others, parables. But to his own people, he explained. Because parables are not for believers. And Jesus did all those things to explain something to us. Listen carefully. That it is through relationship you will have revelation. It is through relationship you will have revelation. You cannot have revelation outside relationship. So he did that. Then when he was closing his teaching series, he said there are many things I didn't tell you. And then they go, what? What about Sermon on the Mount? What about the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the shall hear the earth. Blessed are this. Blessed are what about the Sermon on the Mount? And then what about the teaching you gave us? Eat my flesh, drink my blood, which even made us to lose all the members of our church. You know, that was the teaching that emptied Jesus' church. Eh? When Jesus said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, Moses did not give you manna from heaven. I am the living bread that a man may eat and live. The whole church left. Only the twelve remained. Jesus said to the twelve, won't you go? They said, to whom shall we go? We didn't come for bread and fish. We came for the word of eternal life. And you have that word. We're going to stay with you and hang out with you. Because the truth of the matter is, people who are not looking for Jesus can't stay in a church like Power City. You only stay here when you're looking for Christ. If you're looking for miracle, there are a lot of native doctors in town. You can engage some of them. They will give you miracles. But if you're looking for Christ, you will find Christ here. But remember, when you find Christ, in Christ you have miracles. Miracles are not in the forefront. Christ is in the forefront. But of course, when you find Christ, Christ in you will make things work around you. I'm teaching good here. So our focus is not miracles. Our focus is Christ. That's why we don't have testimony time. We don't have testimony time. Because every day we have testimonies. So we can't devote time to just be hearing testimonies. When the real thing that gathers us is undone. Are we teaching here? Last week somebody called us and said, A lady in America sent an offering to our ministry in America just to thank God because she's, she just kept following my teachings online and she's been healed of lung cancer. Everything gone. They can't even find a trace of it. Now, but we don't have time to be guarding around and asking people, 
jealous. The many churches use testimony as a marketing principle. As advertisement for people to know that there is power in their church. So that they can gather. We, we are not advertising miracles to gather people. We are teaching Christ for people to have Christ. It's important when you belong to a ministry to know what the values and what the focus and what the mission and what the mandate is. Are you, are you following here? Jesus, how many of you observe Jesus never had testimony times in his church? Some he will heal them and tell them, shh, tell nobody. Some he will heal them and say, your own kind of healing need to be certified by the doctor. So go and show yourself eh? to NCDC. Go and show yourself there. Let them give you a certificate that you are fine. Are we here? Jesus never gathered a service or come to a teaching seminar and say, any testimonies? Line up. Give them microphone. Since I joined this commission, God is in this commission. <laughs> Last Sunday, I just went and touched the seat of our father in the Lord. As I just touched the seat, miracle. That seat. So you see people scrambling for the seat. You shall neither in this mountain. <laughs> The thing that is on that seat is inside you. Why go for seat when it's already inside you? Christ in you. Touch your neighbor. Say, I'm not an idol worshiper. We're not here for testimonies. And when you begin to amplify testimonies, you make some people feel like God is selective. Then everybody gets into competition and rat race. Because there's nobody that doesn't want to show that God is with him. Then people start fabricating miracles. Exaggeration enter. Lies enter the whole place. In fact, in some churches, they gather them and train them on how to tell the testimony. Instead of saying it was headache, they'll say, my neck could not shift. All the muscles have dried up. When our father, our daddy in the Lord, our daddy in the Lord, the God of my father. <laughs> I don't worship us everywhere. We don't gather here for miracles. We gather here for him. For him. Every day of my life, I harvest miracles. Every day. If it's not physical in my body, it is protection. If it's not protection, it is favor. If it is not favor, it is direction. If it is not direction, it is ideas. If it is not ideas, it is wisdom. If it is not wisdom, it is solution. If it's not solution, it is an answer. If it's not an answer, I mean, they are happening all the time. How many am I going to testify? And if you are not experiencing what I'm saying, get born again today. Because you can't be born again and not experience. Ayanama. Everyone that is born of God is like the wind. You, can, you cannot tell where it's coming from. You cannot tell. That is all of his life. You just be hearing the sound. You just be hearing the sound. If I'm teaching, say I hear. Glory to God. Please sit and let me push this a little more. How many are we going to testify? Revelation knowledge. You take scripture and the scripture comes alive. There's no miracle like that one. Are we teaching here? We've got to learn to place value on the things that are valuable. And stop placing value on the things that we want to make valuable. There are two different things. Eternal realities. So, they left Jesus' church. Even with breakfast service. Lunch on. Suya night. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? Can I be honest? There are many churches that have people gathered in thousands. If I enter that church and preach, half of the church will leave. Because they don't need Christ. They only came to a native doctor in the name of Jesus. 
They won't survive it. People that don't have Christ cannot survive sound doctrine. They can't. That's how to know people who are saved and those that are not saved. You will know them by the fruit. And that fruit is the fruit that comes out of salvation. Part of the fruit of salvation is the desire to grow in the knowledge of Christ. The desire to grow in his knowledge. The desire to know him. And the desire to be used by him to bring more to his kingdom. Because that's what God is doing on the earth. If I'm teaching good, say I hear you. All right, so Jesus lost the crowd. Everybody left because they couldn't survive that sound doctrine. But you know, I have news for you. More and more, thousands, millions in the world are seeking for the knowledge of Christ. Many people are tired of all this church playing. They are looking for the true knowledge of Christ. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There are thousands in Abuja, millions that don't go anywhere on Sunday. They just sit down at home because they are tired. They are tired. They go to a church where we are 3,000 and miracles start. Only five are healed. The rest of us will go home. Every day we go and come. It's like we are sitting by the pool of Bethesda. Where the angel will turn the water. Where the angel will turn the water. Oh, I forgot that there's a pool in this town. Where the angel will turn the water. And anybody that jumps in first is healed. Anybody that doesn't jump in remains the same. It looks like God is selective. But do you know that Jesus, that God was never in that pool? That pool was superstition. God was never in the pool of Bethesda. It was a superstition among Jewish people. It was a myth. A muthos. Do you understand? God was never there. No, go and read your Bible. God was never in the pool. Because when they were going to the pool of Bethesda, the angel was turning the water once a year. Once. And the day the angel enter, if you are fortunate, they carry on throw inside, you get a miracle. Those that nobody can throw inside, no miracle for them. That's why the man was sitting by the pool for 38 years, nobody to carry him inside. But he must be a stupid man. Because if he was a Nigerian like us, he wouldn't sit by, he would sit inside and be waiting for the arrival of the angel. But the man was sitting outside and waiting for somebody to carry him. He said, who go carry you? Every man on your own. <laughs> but Jesus was not there. Because while the man was waiting and the angel, and can I even be honest with you? No angel came there. It was a superstition. Those miracles just happened by God's mercy accidentally once in a while. And they say it's an angel. For you to know that God was not in that pool. While the man was waiting by the poolside for a miracle, Jesus was already going about doing good. Jesus can be going about doing good and keeping a pool somewhere. Who is God? He's going about healing and kept a pool for people to be waiting. No. So that's why while they were waiting, Jesus observed that they are waiting that side. He said, okay, let me extend my mercy there. He came to the man and said, hey man, will thou be made whole? He said, I have no man. He said, I didn't, you, you can't even answer English. <laughs> There's a way a problem will beat you. You'll be answering nonsense. <laughs> will thou be made whole? What should be the answer? Yes or no? Will thou be made whole? I have no man. I didn't say, do you have a man? <laughs> then watch this. Jesus said, stand up, take your mat and go. Why didn't Jesus say, okay, let me enter the pool, jump inside? He's not in that pool. He's not in that pool. And the moment he healed the man, he went away. He didn't stay with the pool because the pool was not God's device for healing. Jesus was the carrier of God's healing power. And he was going about healing and helping. Am I communicating at all? The healer is inside you. As you're sitting now, all of God's healing power is inside you. God is not selective. He makes his sun to shine on the good and on the bad. He makes his rain to fall on the good and on the bad. He's not selective. All the people that God, Jesus healed, were they not sinners? Somebody say, if you don't repent, God will not heal you. <laughs> the people that Jesus healed, were they not sinners? They were all healed. In fact, there's one who said to Jesus, I don't believe, but help my own belief. And Jesus healed. Jesus healed them all. 
If he did that in the incarnation, how much more in the resurrection? Glory to God. I said, glory to God. I said, glory to God. All right, let's push, let's push, let's push. I have so much to tell you today and you will bear all of them. So let me ask you a question. Is it safe, therefore, to teach solely from the parables of Jesus? Huh? But is it good to understand the parables? But you cannot teach the parables only, right? Now, let's look at one of those parables that is used in many churches today. And when we teach revelation knowledge, people say, ah, uh ah, -uh. why are you trying to sound like you are the only one? The whole body of Christ is doing it and you, you are not doing it. Are you against the body of Christ? Which, where is the body of Christ? I hope you know that the whole body of Christ is not on TV. The whole body of Christ is not on, on radio. And Nigeria is not the whole body of Christ. And the whole body of Christ is not on social media. So how do you know that the body of Christ is not teaching what we are teaching? Say from where you are coming, they were not teaching it. <laughs> Have you been to the whole body of Christ? <laughs> we are we not the body of Christ? Are we not teaching it? As if it was London, honey. Was it London? Yeah, it was London. I think Sister Effie was with us in that trip with Pastor Matthew. Where the man stood up and said, how do I know I am not joining a cult? He said, how do I know I'm not joining a cult? Because Dr. Damina, the things you are teaching, I've been a long-standing Christian. I've not had it anywhere. I said to him, fear not. We are not a cult. We are not a cult. We bring to you the gospel of Christ. And it's available for everybody. We are not a secret society. What we are teaching, we put it out there for everybody to get. I was looking at me. Because it's strange. He's never had it. You know, I went to preach in a church. And I was opening scriptures and they were coming alive. Then Pastor Philemon was, you were there now. He was sitting with the pastors. The pastors started carrying their Bibles one by one and dropping it on the altar. <laughs> this one will carry his woman coming to the altar. Drop the Bible. Ah, is it offering? Bible offering? <laughs> At the point, I was even getting confused because the Bibles were lining up. So I just ignored them and kept preaching. So after the service, I said to Pastor Philemon, Ah, what was that thing about Bibles dropping on the pulpit? <laughs> was it a move of God or something? <laughs> Pastor Philip said to me, those pastors, as we were teaching and teaching, after a while they said, ah, and I've been carrying this Bible. And I didn't see this thing inside. Nonsense. <laughs> this one is not a correct Bible. <laughs> they were dropping their Bible because they were frustrated that this is the same Bible they've been reading and they can't see what I'll see. In fact, a lady came from America, an American, came to Uyo, and then, I mean, came to Nigeria and met me somewhere preaching. And then she, she, she told me she's never had it like this at all. This same verse she's reading, she can't see what I'm seeing. How do I get to see what I'm seeing? I said, don't worry, keep following me. So I used to have a red folder for my Bible. Okay, a red folder. She said, when she went, to, I've changed it to yellow now. <laughs> so that they will know it is not in the red. <laughs> so she got to America and started looking for a red Bible. <laughs> from bookshop to bookshop and unfortunately she didn't find red she saw maroon my own wasn't maroon it was pure red she couldn't find pure red so she called me from america and said dr damina i said yes he said i just want to ask you please don't be angry i said what's the question he said you know um i actually believe she's trying to be spiritual <laughs> I actually believe that uh, there's something about the Bible that you use. <laughs> I said to her, what is that? <laughs> she said, no, I mean that Bible you're using, that red one, you know the red one? I said, yes, I know the red one. She said, there's something about that Bible because every time you preach from that Bible, I see things I didn't see before. I said, okay, so, so what about it? He said, I've gone around the bookshops 
all over Texas looking for that red Bible. Can you tell me where you bought it from so I can go and get one? I said that red folder is not a Bible. It's a folder. He said, oh, really? <laughs> it's just a red folder where I put my teaching notes. So she thought it was my Bible. It's the same Bible that you read, I read. But in the New Testament, they shall know me. Relationship determines revelation. That's very key. Relationship is the key to revelation. Now, let me move this into a whole new level. So, listen carefully. One of the parables that they use all the time is what they call Operation Push. How many of you have heard about Push? P-U-S-H. What is, what is the meaning of Push? Pray until something... You know the scripture where they got operation push from? Luke 18 verse 1. Let's go there. Luke 18 verse 1 is a parable. One of the parables of Jesus. And he spake a parable unto them to this end. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now you know Luke was a unique writer. Luke, Luke's parables a lot of times, most of brother Luke's parables were a contrast. Please, that's key. Don't miss that. Most of his parables were a contrast. While Matthew and Mark were very direct, Luke picked out the contrast in Jesus' parables. And Luke's parables were just like that. Now, what is a contrast? It means to explain something from the opposites. To explain something from the opposites. That's the way Luke wrote his books. Now in Luke 18.1, but just before I move further, what were parables meant for? They were meant for unbelievers. Now, so this parable in Luke 18.1, was it for believers or unbelievers? Unbelievers. So, we are going to read now a parable. Again, what is a parable? A teaching for men whose hearts... Uh, is wax gross in unbelief. Another thing about parables is that when people try to fit into the characters of the parables, they say, I am the prodigal son. My pastor is the elder brother. God is our father. <laughs> no, you don't fit into the characters of a parable. Because those characters most times are fictions. So you can't be putting yourself, like you say, the parable of wise and foolish virgins. I don't know if I am wise or if I am foolish. Who is wise and who is foolish? It's a parable. The parable of two shall be on the bed. One shall be taking the other left. So you and your husband, who will go? Two of you are born again. Two of you are filled with the Holy Ghost. So when the trumpet sound, who will go? Oh, somebody said me. <laughs> your husband is also saying me at the other side. <laughs> so those are parables. You don't fit into the characters of those parables. So what do you do with the parable? You read the parable and you look for the lesson that the parable seeks to communicate. You don't take parables, hook, line, and sinker. You look for the message. So in every parable, there's a lesson. Especially this one we're looking at in Luke chapter 18. So let's go. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Verse 2. Saying, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. There's no way in the world you can talk about God and use this particular man. Look at verse 3. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. You are not a widow. Are you a widow? So you can't use that for yourself as a believer. Look at verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> And he will not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. Next verse. Yet, because this widow troubled me, push. Don't stop till God answers you. 
I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming, she weary me. I will not let you go till you bless me. Who hath blessed us? Who hath? I will not let you go. Jacob, pray until God break your tie. <laughs> if God break your tie, you are finished. <laughs> because it is not only tie that will break, everything will break. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm teaching good. Now, let's look at the characters before we go any further. Number one, the man is an unjust judge. Genesis 18, 25 says God is a righteous judge. So that man cannot be God. So what Luke is doing is he's using a contrast. An unjust judge. Then a widow. We are not widows. Then she said, avenge me of my adversary. These are the key things you pay attention to. That is, get me justice or defend me. Verse 5, verse 5, verse 5 of Luke 18. Yet because this widow troubled me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming, she wearies me. God is not somebody that can be tired. But this woman will get tired. The widow was actually nagging the man. Won't you answer me? Look at me. I lost my husband. I'm a poor widow. Will you just ignore me? My husband died long ago. I have nobody. And then he tells her, please, madam, please, madam, leave me, let me focus. She goes home and sends him text message. Please, I beg you, in the name of God, if you fear God at all, respond to this text message. If you are fearing God, remember God is a husband to the widow. Respond to this text message. She tortured them. <laughs> now, so she keeps saying it. She keeps saying it. She keeps saying it. Verse 6. The unjust judge said, I will only answer because she keeps coming. Okay? I will only answer because she is crying and always disturbing me. She is sending people to beg me. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 of that look. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he be along with them. Next verse. Now I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? He will avenge them speedily. Contrast. In the case of the widow with the judge, she had to trouble him. She had to discover him. She had to beg him. She had to trouble him till he was like, look, for me to be free from this woman, let me answer her. Contrast. God, who is your father, he answers speedily. You don't need operation push. Operation push is for unbelievers. Believers have nothing to push. I'm teaching good. God will answer speedily. Now, put your finger there. Look at another previous contrast from Luke. Luke 11 verse 5. Talking about a friend. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Who is a friend? Huh? A friend is a friend. Okay? So, he has a friend. Lend me. Lend me. Not give me. Not dash me. Lend me. Okay? We don't lend from God. So, how can that be prayer? That's not a teaching on prayer. Verse 6 and 7 of that Luke chapter 11. Look at verse 6 and 7. For a friend of mine is in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Next verse. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. How can this be prayer? Can you imagine? Verse 8. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. 
So he tell you that the man actually had children and there was a continual talking. What kind of friend is this? Now remember, in every parable, always read everything. So verse 9, the contrast. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Next verse, contrast. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Eh? Contrast. The other one, he said, I'm in bed. It's too late. Why didn't you come on time? This one, seek, you find. Knock, the door shall be opened. Look at the next verse. For if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? And if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Next verse. I love this. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Next verse. If you then, who is he speaking parables to? Unbelievers. If you unbelievers that are evil, know how to good, give good gifts unto your children. Contrast. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? If it's clear, can I have a good amen? amen. Now, so he's using contrast. Is there anything to learn from that? We should learn that evil people with good relationship are answered. Evil people with good relationship. In Luke 8, 8, I mean 18, 8, look at Jesus' mode of communication. Luke 18, verse 8, where we started from. I tell you that he will avenge you speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. The word nevertheless means he's switching the tone. He said to you, he will avenge you speedily. God will answer quickly. Nevertheless. When the son of man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Now when he says the son of man comes, what is he talking about? When the son of man comes, he's talking about the end of the time. He's talking about the last day. When the son of man comes. Now remember, Jesus is not coming for you. Jesus is not coming for you. He's coming back again. My Lord is coming back again. He went away and promised that he's coming back again. He's coming back again. My Lord is coming back again. Oh, glory, hallelujah. He's coming back again. But it's not coming for you. So who is he coming for? He's coming to judge those who reject the gospel. He's coming, he said, judgment for those who reject the gospel. What about you? You're already in him. So he's not coming for you. He's coming with you. You and him are coming together. It is called the parousia. The earnestly creature waited earnestly for the parousia. The manifestation of the sons of God. So the coming of Christ is the coming of the sons. You don't understand what I'm saying. In that coming is where our full glory will manifest. That's when mortality shall put on immortality. There will be no limitation. The glory of the new creation will be manifest without limits. So the coming is with us. But for those who reject the gospel. So when he shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. I'm teaching good. So you and Christ are coming together. Christ is not coming for you. You are in him, he's in you. Now how, how will somebody you are inside be coming for you? It's like those billboards you see, divine visitation. <laughs> divine visitation. The Lord will visit you. <laughs> he lives in me. The person living in me can be visiting me. Except two of us are visiting him. <laughs> Glory to God. Are we together here? So now that contrast in Luke chapter 18. I'm just using all of that to show you how limited the parables of Jesus were. Then he says when the son of man comes the last day. Shall he find faith on the earth? That's a rhetorical question. Now to us the church the son of God has given us faith. 
He has already given us faith. So then faith by hearing and hearing by the message of Christ. Romans 10, 17. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by what? The faith. So he can't give you faith and be saying when he comes, shall he find faith? He already gave you faith. So shall he find faith means he's coming to judge those who rejected the faith that he gave them in the gospel. Is it clear? It's contrast. Brother Luke used a lot of contrast to communicate the character of God. When you hear the son of man, he's referring to the day of the Lord. So, one other person I want to talk about briefly is the adversary. Now, how many of you know we have said that the Old Testament had a limited knowledge about God? Did you, did you remember we said that? Limited knowledge. Even the devil, please, if you want to sleep, sleep now. Because I want to talk about Satan small. I want to give you a little gist about Satan. Even the devil, the way they spoke about God in the Old Testament says a lot to us about what they knew about God in the Old Testament. And most of the junkies we know about God today came from the Old Testament. Most of the rubbish that we know about God came from the Old Testament. You go to a funeral and a preacher takes time to tell you everything is the will of God. Who are we to question God? God has done his thing. We just have to praise him. Brother, we are not Muslims. We are not Muslims. It's in Islam that everything that happens is God. We are not Muslims. In Christianity, we know God in Christ. Am I teaching good? Where do we know God? So, turn to your neighbor and say, faith in Christ unveils God. Do you believe in Christ? Because see, if you don't believe in Christ, you will never know God. No man can come to the Father except by me. He that has seen me has seen the Father. You can never know God until you know Christ. We are not Muslims. Stop telling me it is God that killed that small child. Stop telling me that that woman died because God called her home. Which home? Who told you she was not at home? Where is home? In Christ. Are you not at home? Uh -uh. He said God is calling. Home where? Home where? We are at home with Christ. Right now. He said oh no 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 no. God, God knows that if he had allowed you to be alive. You will have committed more sin. Is he afraid of sin? God made you blind because the way you look like this. If you say you can get eye, women go suffer for your hand. <laughs> you know people think like that. And people talk like that. And they use that to define the character of God. They don't know God. But we know God. And we can define God's character. Oh glory to God. I feel like jumping and running in this building. Touch your neighbor. Say, I know God. There's a reason why I'm asking you to touch your neighbor because some people, their meditation is not normal. <laughs> Glory. Glory. Say, I know God in Christ. So you go to a funeral and the preacher is busy preaching. Then somebody asks me somewhere, Dr. Damina, do you have a notebook for burial? I'm not a burial minister. Let the dead bury their dead. There is no special service in burial. Once a man dies, open the ground, drop him inside. Glory to God. If you are not born again, you will soon enter the hole. Before you enter this hole, you need to be sure of where you are going. Are you sure? If not, give your life now. I mean, give your heart now. We pray for Christ to come in. Simple. We are finished burial. Cover the ground. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Praise God. We don't need special service for burial. Moreover, that brother is not dead. He just slept. When he's tired, he will wake up. 
on the resurrection day. And if the man is not born again, well, sorry. We'll never see him again. So when we're paying the last respect, we'll look at it two, two, two times. That's the end. That's why when you see sinners, don't smile. Because they have no second-hand value. Don't smile. You can't afford to be happy with a sinner's condition. Because any whim, it's over. Eternally. Eternally. You and them will never meet. Your uncle, your mother, your father, your children, your friends that don't know Christ. If anything happens, whim now. That's the end of that union. That is forever and ever. Titi Lai Lai. Two of you. People. <laughs> you guys will never meet again. It's a serious matter. I'm preaching good? Yes, sir. So, the, the funeral, you hear preachers say, ah, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. They are junior pastors of Job. And then, when we now want to ask questions, but God, why? He say, ah! Hey! Ah! Hey! Don't ask God questions. If God was like that, that means every time the disciples ask Jesus questions, he will have ministered to them. Pua! How dare you talk like that? Say, Jesus, come, come. We want to ask you a question. Why do your disciples eat without washing their hands? Jesus will have said, how dare you ask God a question? Next. He said, no, no, I've changed my mind. <laughs> but they were always asking Jesus questions. Even some, they asked him to tempt him. Some, they asked him to trap him. And he answered them. Didn't he answer them? So, if Jesus answers questions, it means God answers questions. It means you can ask God questions. If there are things you don't understand, you say, God, come, let's reason together. Let's talk about Because this thing doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. Maybe you have an explanation and in case you don't have, quickly let me know now so I take charge. It doesn't add up. It doesn't look like what you as, the word has provided. And the Holy Spirit by the word of God will bring your mind to a number of scriptures that will come together in your understanding and show you what the matter is. How many of you agree with what I'm teaching here? God wants you to know why things happen the way they happen. There's a teaching series on why do things happen the way they happen. We've done season one, season two. I'm going to do season three and four this year. Why things happen the way they happen on the earth? Because God is not mysterious. All the mystery about God was demystified when God became a man. Walk upon the face of the earth. You touched him. He touched you. He ate. You ate. He stood where you stood. That was the end of the mystery about God. He brought himself for his family to know him. Somebody shout, I hear you. Tell your neighbor you can ask God questions. Then tell your neighbor all the questions you are about to ask God. He saw you asking it. And ahead of time, he answered it in the scriptures. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Praise God. I said praise God. So let's have a view from Adam. That will tell us something. When we talk about evil, people say God can do evil. People say God can do good. Then people say the evil is part of God's goodness. Wow. So I said, fine. If God can do evil and call it good, we too can do evil and call it good. Then they said, no, it is meant for good. <laughs> the evil is meant for God. All things working for my good. I need to destroy that song now. I like the, the song. But the song doesn't make sense. All things can be working for your good. All things can be working for your good. Sickness is not working for your good. Poverty is not working. Have you ever seen where poverty did good for somebody? Poverty makes people smell. All things are not working for your good. 
When he said all things work together for good, there was a context. It's not a general statement. It's unbelievers are using it like that. We are not unbelievers. Is intentional? No. The intent is not for all things to work together. Then they crossbreed it. All things are working together for your good. You meant it for evil. God turned it for good. Two different contexts. Dealing with two different circumstances. Communicating two different messages. That is contempt of the Bible. You know, I was asking one of, I was asking a church, but one of the magistrates in church said to me, I said to her, if a lawyer goes into the court, into the court of law, and quotes the Nigerian constitution out of context, what will happen to the lawyer? She said, that's contempt of court. That's contempt of court. That's abusing the intelligence of the constitution that holds the republic together. That's a crime. I say, and pastors are quoting the Bible out of context. Woto, woto. They are criminals. Any pastor that quotes the Bible out of context is a criminal. It's contempt of Bible. <laughs> if lawyers cannot quote the, Bible, the constitution out of context, why should a man of God that lawyers ought to learn from be quoting the Bible out of context? Disorderly. Plucking out scriptures as if he's plucking out mangoes. Pluck it, pluck it, pluck this one, pluck this one. Then combine them together and create a thought that does not exist. That's evil. That's immoral. Am I teaching here? That's immoral. So why does he say all things work together for good? Is it not Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8. After talking about for those he for new. He predestinated. Those he predestinated, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Then I say, all these things, which things? The, the foreknowledge, the predestination, the call, the justification, the glorification of God is to work together for the salvation of the believer. So all things working together is the salvation of God, not circumstances of your life. You can't say all things work together for your good. Okay, Jesus is in a boat and they are traveling and there's a storm and Jesus starts singing all things working for my good. It's intentional. You will soon be buried. That's the intent. But Jesus stands up. He stands up, no joke. Stop. Peace, be still. And there was a calm. That means there are situations that come to you. You don't smile. Hey! Hey! Stop that! Out! Out! Your first child is sick. The second one is sick. The third one is... Ah! Uh -uh. Ah! Uh -uh. Under my watch. You know, during homecoming, my daughter took ill. Sit down. My daughter took ill during homecoming. My first daughter, Jemima. She just became sick for nothing. She just told the mother, I slept last night. I can't bend my neck. So we thought his pillow. You know the pillow stuff. So we just say, okay, let's watch. Just use warm water. Touch it with a uh, rub. And just let's see how you feel. So she's carrying the neck. Homecoming is on. I'm under so much pressure. I've been teaching for 30 days. I came out of 30 days into homecoming. People are coming from everywhere. And I have to teach. Under that pressure. This distraction is coming. Like joke, like joko. I'm not joking. Like joke, like joke. She couldn't move the neck. Then, she was in severe pain. The following day, she said she couldn't sleep the whole night. She started running temperature. Then she can't climb steps. She'll be breathing like she's going to collapse. <gasps> Just to climb a few steps. So quickly, I sent for doctors. The doctors came and didn't know what they started calling names of sickness for children that are suffering poverty. They started with meningitis. Then they said they have to lie her down and use something to open her spinal cord. In Nigeria, open my spinal cord. Doctors that I'm not sure I've seen very well. I said, no, don't go to that spinal cord first. Then they called names. They were calling names. Then they now said, 
I'm preaching and coming home, and they are doing experiment with my daughter. They say now they are going to be giving her intravenous injection. We should be bringing her to hospital and taking her back. First of all, they want you to admit. I say no, nobody in my house is admitted. My house is the admission center. So you guys go. To, so they took her, brought her, took her, brought her. Then she now said, Daddy, when we go, they will now choke me, and they will bring one antibiotic that is very hot like fire. Then when they put it, the thing will be burning. I'll be seeing the thing boiling. The thing is developing dimensions. They say go and do tests, heart tests, liver tests, kidney tests. <laughs> they say they can't see anything. Then they say it must be pneumonia. Then they say they can't see anything. Then they now study all kinds of things. They say they have to see a lung expert. Then they now say they have to see a heart. I say, wait, 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 wait. I told her mother, I want to spend time and pray with the, with the girl. Okay, So I went to where she was. Because she couldn't even go to her room. She had to be sleeping in the sitting room because she couldn't climb steps. I just came to her and said, baby, let me pray for you, okay? For close to one hour, I was just spoke peace to her body. The temperature started living, everything started living. Started living. Left. I told him, stop all the, the, the mother said, those antibiotics, throw them away. I said, she has not finished the course. He said, which course? Throw them away. She has taken more than enough for a lifetime. Throw them away. <laughs> That's how the girl recovered. She's all over the world now, jumping around. No trace, nothing again. Let the devil not come to your house and be jumping and you're there looking, speaking English. When is this coming from? It's coming from where it came from. The important thing is not where it came. <laughs> Stop! be still. Are we teaching here? And any one of you under undue pressure right now wearing the sound of my voice, I command that pressure stop! Cease! In the name of Jesus. Now I want you to use your own voice and shout peace be still. Say that three times. In Jesus name. It's done. Somebody say I take authority. Say it cannot happen under my watch. God is a good God. Evil doesn't come from God. I didn't hear a good amen. Please sit down. A friend of mine said he went to pray for somebody that had cancer, and she told him God gave her cancer to teach him a, teach her a lesson. So he said, Father, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Add more cancer so that the lesson will enter. She said, No. He said, ah, But you say it's God teaching. Now we want the lesson to come from every direction. So if it is not God teaching you a lesson, you better believe for a miracle right now. Why will God use sickness to teach his children? How many of you will give your children to Boko Haram for lecture? God is a good God. Oh, I said God is a good God. Oh, I said God is a good God. So now, look at this. Mm -mm. So, the all things are working for my good. We need to look at that some very carefully. Because, uh -uh, it has no scriptural scriptural insight. It doesn't back up scriptures. It doesn't agree with scriptures. All things can be working for my good. The ones that work for my good got me saved. I'm already saved. So which other good are they working for? Is it clear? Please, it's important. Now, some say God does evil. I can manage those ones. The most dangerous ones are those that say God permits evil. God permitted it. Those ones are the worst. God didn't do it. But God allowed it. So now we can break that mystery by understanding a basic truth. I love James. James is not my favorite apostle, but I love James for something he did. You know, Romans 5.12 tells us, put it up quickly, because we are dealing with a few things. Romans 5.12, are you still in the building? Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Question, what came by sin? Huh? So therefore, what was responsible for death? Sin. Okay, notice Adam. Genesis 2.16 and 17. Please, I beg you, stay with me. Genesis 2.16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden that thou mayest freely of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Next verse. 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That, that word thou shalt surely die means in dying you shall die. So God gave man a will to choose. If you are making notes, that's not a note to miss out on. God gave man a will to choose. So, Romans 5, 12, by one man, sin entered. Which means, it wasn't God that permitted. It was man that permitted. God said, eat of the tree of life. But God gave man a will. And man chooses or refuses. Pay attention. James 1, 13 and 14. James chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. Let no man ever say that. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Next verse. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Next verse. Then when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Next verse. Do not err, my beloved brother. That word err is the Greek word plana o. Do not be led astray, my beloved brethren. And this leading astray is through teaching. Don't let anybody teach you something that contradicts the character of God. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Next verse. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So, James unveils sin to us. That sin is a function of man's free will. Sin is is a function of man's free will. That sin is a function of man's desire. Sin is a function of man's desire. Listen carefully please. Knowing that, so the tempter of sin is the devil. The tempter of sin is the devil. So if that came by sin, and sin doesn't come from God. The tempter of sin, therefore, will be the devil. Look at Jesus. Jesus is in the wilderness. And for the first time, please look at me, pay attention. For the first time, Satan is unveiled. The first unveiling of Satan. The first time. In the wilderness where Jesus is fasting. The devil came to him and three times the devil did to Jesus what he did to Eve. He began to ask, I mean, ask questions and cast aspersions on the integrity of God's word. And that's what Satan does. When he comes to you, he will question the integrity of God's word. Or he will make the word of God like a joke. Or he will look for how to use your religious mindset. To put holes in the scripture. That is why if you don't understand scripture. You are the cheapest prey for Satan. Once you don't understand scripture. You are the cheapest landing ground for Satan. That's why Jesus will say you do err. Because you know not the scripture. Nor the power of God. The scriptures and understanding of the scripture. Is a restraining force on the devil. When you know scripture. Satan cannot jump around. But once he makes you understand the Bible upside down, he takes over. So let me tell you this. People that Satan will use for breakfast are people who avoid Bible study. Proper Bible study. Satan will just be jumping around with your life. Nothing is stopping him because all, all the hedges that are supposed to protect you are broken down because you do not know the scripture. The only thing Satan fears is the word. Can you imagine? Satan is confronting Jesus the word, quoting the word. Satan comes, because Satan knows when it really gets down, the only thing that matters is the knowledge of God's word. 
And Jesus didn't tell Satan, do you know who am I? The incarnate Christ. I am the incarnate. How dare you talk to me like that? No, who you are doesn't matter to Satan. It's what comes out of your mouth. It is written. It is written. It is three times. Get it behind me. Then the Bible says, and Satan left for a season. He didn't live permanent. He will never live permanent. He lives for a season. He comes again. To see if you are still sticking to that word. How did Satan get Eve out of Eden? What did God say? Madam, what did God say? And unfortunately, Madam didn't know what God said. But she knew Brazilian hair. She knew Cotonou hair. She knew all the hairstyles, but she didn't know scripture. She was advanced in fashion with no scripture. Madam, what did God say? He said, God said we shouldn't touch. See, I said, I don't get up. Once you don't know the word of God, you are Satan's bread. He will just be chopping you like bread. The restraining force is the word. The most dangerous man on earth is a man that is born again and knows what it means to be born again. I'm teaching good. Yeah. You need to know the scriptures. And not this one you quote, no condition is permanent. It's not in the Bible. Even Satan knows that that thing is not Bible. So when you quote it, he will laugh. <laughs> Don't worry, your own will be permanent. Your own condition will be permanent. So four years, five years, you are in the same plane. Nothing is changing. Like the brother who asked the question in the first service. Four or five years, nothing is changing. Satan is telling you, say you say no condition is permanent. This one is permanent. You pray, pray, pray. Nothing is changing. Then after a while, you start thinking, maybe it's the will of God. Because you don't know the scriptures. So you settle for what Satan is saying. And before you know it, they now start telling you it's family patterns. It's bloodline. Bloodline. Yes, yeah, service of the firstborns. Firstborn service. If you are a firstborn, you cannot miss the service. And as you are coming, bring a seed according to your age. How old are you? 30, 30,000. How old are you? That if you don't, if you don't, if you bring it less than your age, you will be demoted in age, <laughs> or you'll be buried the year before your age. Wicked, wicked things, and because you don't know the scripture, why not you borrow? You bring, then they tell you to lie down on the altar and be rolling from one end to another with your money in your hand. See, as you are rolling, God is turning your life around. So when they have told you that one, they have sacked you. Just be rolling like roller. Ta, 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 ta. God, turn it fast. You know not the scripture. Just using you for assignment. And you, in your religious mind, you believe that the more activity, the faster God will do it. That's why you must know the scripture. Teaching good? That's why you must grow in the knowledge of Christ. The restraining force for the believer is the knowledge of Christ. And knowledge is not a gift. Knowledge is the acceptance of responsibility. See the way all of you are sitting down? You are laboring, I'm laboring. I'm laboring in talking, you are laboring in writing and thinking. And listening. Many things are trying to get your attention, you just stay focused by force. That's the responsibility. Now when you know the word of God, you can enjoy life. You speak God's word, you see things come to pass. Somebody shout hallelujah. And you must know the word accurately. You must know the word how? Accurately. Say, God said we shouldn't touch. Satan said, God is wise. He knows if you eat it. You will be like him now. You understand? You'll be like him. Don't you want to be like him? I want to be like him. Eat it. She ate and gave Adam to eat with her. Two of them ate. And their eyes opened. Ah! If not like this, you miss things. You say, Adama, Adama. <laughs> they enter leave all of them went into the bush God said Adam where are you it's a rhetoric question it's not as he doesn't know where they were he was telling them you have left where you are supposed to be you have rejected my offer now you have entered the wilderness of life how did it happen lack of the knowledge of God's word the wrong knowledge of God's word actually the wrong knowledge because Eve had some knowledge but it was not the right knowledge 
Adam also had knowledge because God was talking to Adam and expected Adam to teach Eve. But Adam was a lazy husband. You know, there are husbands that are lazy. They know scripture, but they don't teach their wife and children. So when the wife start acting like a junior devil in the house, the husband don't know what to do because when it was time for you to put Christ inside, you were putting, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I love you cannot cast out demons. <laughs> Your wife is not serious. You go to church, you leave her at home, and you come home and you're happy. Madam, how far now? You cook for me, yes. You go to chop food, Satan go chop you on your wife. As a good husband, you must bring your wife with you to teach him. So that what you know, she knows. Two of you become a force that Satan cannot fight. You must bring your children along. So that your children too are growing. So that when the family gather together, they bring firewood. The house is on flames. When Satan is passing, beware of that demons. Yeah, all demons. Beware of that house. Don't cross there. Because if you cross the cross, you will not come for your rescue. <laughs> Glory! And if your wife is not following you, begin to pray for her. That her eyes be open. And make sure you give her all that she needs to hear the word. Put the word all over. If your husband is not following you, put the word all over. Put love all over and prayer. And stand in faith. Your children, same. I'm teaching good. Don't leave anybody at home. Any one of your family members beginning to slack behind, drag him. Pull their ear. Be careful. Not in this house. Neither give room to Satan teaching good? So the first time Satan is unveiled, listen carefully, from Genesis to Malachi, they didn't know Satan. So the first time Satan will be unveiled is in the temptation. That's the first time in the entire Bible. The unveiling of Satan is in the temptation of Jesus. That's when we now know that Satan has come. Okay? Am I teaching? Now, stay with me. Stay with me. In the Old Testament, they're ignorant of Satan. Now, when we read the parables, it says Satan will come immediately and steal the word. Did we see that? So, who will Satan steal the word from? Matthew 13, 19. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not... Then come at the wicked one. Once you hear the word and you do not understand the word, then Satan will come and catch it away. So with all you are getting, get understanding. Make up your mind to understand. When we teach, stay with it till you understand it. If you don't understand it, get the message, play it, pray in tongues, play it again. Understanding is your security. Get understanding. A lack of understanding of the word gives Satan a room in people's lives. A lack of understanding of the word gives Satan room in people's lives. So when you don't understand the word, you create room for Satan. Because Satan functions in darkness. Satan can function unhindered when we don't have an understanding of God's word. Remember he is called the ruler of the darkness of this world. He rules only, only in darkness. Satan cannot rule in light. And it is the entrance of his word that gives it light. Teaching good? Pay attention. Now if you read the account of Moses. You will know that Moses was very ignorant of the devil. What Moses saw was a serpent. Moses never mentioned Satan throughout all of his writing. Was he afraid? No, he just didn't know him. They were ignorant of Satan in the Old Testament. So they wrote things that Satan did and gave God the glory. You didn't hear that? They wrote things that Satan did and gave the credit to God. Moses was ignorant of Satan so what Moses kept saying was serpent, serpent. But Jesus said in John 8 chapter 44, John 8 44, you have your father the devil and the loss of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. 
Now, in the revelation of John, Revelation 20 verse 2, put it up for me. Revelation chapter 20 verse number 2. And he laid hold on the dragon that that old serpent, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. So, the person that spoke to Eve was not a snake. Eve. And in some churches, they will tell you that Satan used uh, that serpents used to walk that time. They had legs. Where did they get it from? It's a lie. Serpents have never walked before. They always crawled. Walk where now? Are we teaching? People just read their imaginations into the Bible. Me, I was even taught that Satan, Satan was a choir master. Oh, you went to my kind of church. <laughs> that Satan was a choir master. All the instruments were inside his body. So when he does like this, violin and guitar will be playing. When he does like this, the drum set will be playing. <laughs> So when Satan moves, you just be hearing musical instruments. Were you taught that? It's a lie. Then they tell you that is why worldly music is sweet. Because Satan was a choir master. So when he fell from heaven, he took the music department. And now made it an unbelieving department. It's a lie. If didn't see serpent, there was no serpent in Eden. No. She heard Satan speak in her mind like he speaks to you today in your thoughts. Are we following? Yes. When Adam, when, now, you know Genesis, the book of Genesis, Moses was not there. How many of you know Moses, Moses was born in Exodus 2.2? 2, 2. So Genesis has finished. So how will Moses be able to write the story of Genesis? Two different things. Number one, he saw a vision. Now, in the language of visions, it is metaphorical. When you see visions, you see metaphors. It's not writing, it's pictures. So, for like Peter, when Peter was in the upper room praying, and he saw four-footed beasts coming out, and they say, rise up, kill and eat. He said, it is unclean. God said, ah, I have cleaned it, you shall not call it unclean. There were no animals in that room. Were there animals in that room? So there was no serpent in Eden. And there were no trees. It's what Moses saw in a vision to communicate what happened in Eden. But Moses couldn't interpret it well. So he just wrote it the way he saw it. Allowing us today by the spirit to be led to all the truth to see exactly what Moses didn't see. So the serpent was the devil. That old dragon. Let me give you another scripture in Revelation that calls the devil a serpent. And that's Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. Revelation chapter 12 verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Brother Paul, giving a corroboration to what John is seeing. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. The serpent, alright? Now, so it is the epistles that unveil Satan to us. Satan is not known in the Old Testament. So, everything that happened, God was blamed for it. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil, he will flee. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom to devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. And you will not find such statements in the Old Testament. Because they were ignorant. 1 John 1 5. Put it up and we shall read like a mass choir. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. Are you still here? Yeah. Are you tired? No. This then, can we go? One, two, go. 
This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is what? So you won't find a trace of darkness in God. John 14, 9. Jesus says, he that has seen me has seen the father. John 1, 18. No one has seen God at any time except the son of man. So everything Jesus says is the exact representation of the father. How do I know God always wants to heal the sick? Because Jesus went everywhere healing the sick. I believe Jesus more than I believe Moses. Moses was a prophet. Jesus was the message. He is God who became a man. He is the perfect imprint of God. He is the sole representation of God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 12 says, 12 verse 1 and 2 says, Look away from the Old Testament people. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. So we must never focus on any Old Testament character. Focus on Christ. What we know about the Father must be seen in the Son. Moses never mentioned Satan because he didn't know who Satan was. Are you still here? But the Holy Spirit unveiled. How many of you know the story of Cain and Abel? If you read Genesis chapter 4, it's like two brothers went to do something and then all of a sudden one brother is angry with the other one and he carries stick and kill the other one. But that's not what happened. But how to know what happened in Genesis 4? You come to the New Testament, 1 John 3, 12. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So question, who killed Abel? Eh? Satan. Satan killed Abel using Cain. The spirit behind the killing was Satan. Is it clear? But because Moses didn't know Satan, he couldn't explain. So it took the Holy Spirit to guide us into all the truth concerning what happened in Genesis chapter 4. The Holy Spirit unveils the details of scripture to us. Can I have a good amen? Let's look at a few things here. First Samuel 19, 9. First Samuel 19 verse 9. And the evil spirit from the Lord Evil spirit from where? Don't be easy. Help me now. Evil spirit from where? No, be you right now. Evil spirit from where? Was upon Saul. As he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. Wow. When the sun came, he was casting out evil spirits from men. So how can he be the one casting out and be the one sending? How? First Samuel 16, 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Uh, you are not reading. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. <laughs> can you see? Eh? The spirit of the Lord departed. Then God replaced the spirit with the evil spirit. How does that sound? So you see that it was a general knowledge. Look at Isaiah 45. Now, before we go there. What did John just tell us? God is light and in him. Eh? Can you shout it? Let the devil hear that you know what you're talking about. Let me ask you, is sickness light, disease light, poverty light, failure light, struggling light? What about wilderness? You know, they say teaching on God will take you through the wilderness. You know that teaching? Eh? They call it baptism of fire. It's fraud. Why will God take you to the wilderness when he has brought you to the city of the great king? You came to Zion. The city of God. Then God now says, city is not good for you. Go back to wilderness. 
It doesn't make sense. Now, like the brother asked this morning, how do I know if it is God or not when, when I'm praying for something and that thing does not happen and I'm waiting and waiting and it's like, I don't know if it is God or not and then I have somebody, a mother or somebody telling me that if it is God, it will have happened. So since it is not happening, maybe it is not God. Maybe it's not the will of God. So how do I know whether it's the will of God or not? First of all, first things first, God is good. Eh? Eh? Every good thing comes from God. So question, is it good? That's where you start from. If it is not good, check. It's not God. Okay? Confusion. Is there confusion? Yes. If there's confusion, it's not God because God is not the author of confusion. Check. Are you following? Okay. Is it destructive? Because God does not destroy. If that circumstance is destructive, God cannot be in it. So check. You start checking. How do I know? Because it could narrow down to how do I know whether God wants me to walk in that office or not to walk in that office? It's easy. As you begin to obey the basic word of God that you know. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go and make disciples. As you begin to preach and make disciples, you're obeying the basic word of God that you know, then it will now move into you knowing the unknown. You won't know the unknown till you've done the known. You can't be living in disobedience to the word of God and then now you want God to tell you what to do. No, it's first things first. You don't go to university without primary school. I'm teaching good. You have to first of all obey the one you know before God will now begin to throw light for you in the ones that scripture said nothing about. Including what to eat, where to sleep, which job to do, which business to apply for, which business to withdraw from, which school to put your children in. Do you know that God is interested in the school your children attend? Oh yes, God is. It's just that you don't know that God is. That's why you went and put them in an expensive school where you're borrowing to pay fees. If you knew that God was interested in your children's education, you will rely on God to lead you and God will lead you to a school where you won't borrow to pay fees. It is not school that makes children. It is not school that makes children. If it is school, Abel Damina will never come to town. My primary school no get head. My father was pastoring in a remote village where the primary school closest to the village was two hours of trekking and there were no vehicles. So every morning my father would wake me up by 5 a.m. and put me on the road. I will trek and get to school by 7, 7 something. When I have reached school, I have worked for the day. When I enter class, I sleep because I just finished working. By the time I'm recovering, class is getting over. Then I start thinking of trekking back. Sometimes I will sleep on the road. Into the night, they will carry bicycle and come and package me. How will I know what in a delay? All this English where you hear, the grace of God. Not the school work. <laughs> My school didn't have head. But see where I am. I am a proof that school doesn't make children. So don't kill yourself borrowing, borrowing and becoming a nuisance in the name of keeping your children in a school that has an image. Class. You don't need public image. You need Christ's image, which you already have. My children went to public school. Public in the sense that the school fees, we didn't need to think about it. When mama was paying school fees for my children, you know the way they make lists for market? Maggi, onion. So that's that. So that's it. Take and go. The way we they give money for market, now so then they pay school fees. 2000 1500 for three months. No, I'm serious. That's where my children went. They didn't go to, you, you took them to school sometimes. You were living, one school like that, that doesn't have name. And they went there faithfully. And pass well. Finish secondary school. Then when it was time for university, now I had the ability to put them in the school of their choice. So I could afford the fees. And I sent them to the school that they wanted to go. And I didn't fast to pay the fees. 
The, the fees, we paid fees one year ahead. It's supposed to be every month. We, we paid for one year and just forgot the fees. And we're doing other things. The following year, we paid another one and forgot. Why put your children in it? If you're working with God, <laughs> my yoke is easy. If it's God leading you, you won't be under pressure. I just answered a lot of questions now. See, when God is involved in something, you will know it's God because he takes away the pressure. When you are carrying pressure, God is not there. Or God doesn't give pressure. His body is light. These are the indices you use. And then God says, when I speak to you, it will be peace. So if it is God, you will have peace. As if they pour cold water inside your heart. The word of God brings joy. So if it is God leading you, you will have joy. Joy is not happiness. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is tied to things. Joy is tied to God's word. Things around may not be working, but you, are, you have joy. Am I talking to somebody here? So if it is God, there will be joy. There will be peace. If it is God, there will be liberty. Where the spirit of God is. Anything you are doing there, there is no liberty. It's not God. I'm teaching good. I said I'm teaching good. So when you start praying for something, it, it's easy. Just listen to the Holy Ghost as you are praying. Just listen. Just listen. You will know what to do. You know what to do. And it is because you don't follow God's word that it's easy for Satan to trap you. And get you entangled in things that will mess you up. Embarrass you and disgrace you. But if you follow God, there will be no pressure. I'm teaching good here. My sheep hear my voice. Except you are a goat. My sheep hear my voice. The voice of a stranger they will not hear. Take no thought what you shall eat. Take no thought what you shall wear. Most times our problem is we are in a competition without knowing. Get out of that competition. Touch your neighbor and say get out of that competition. You are not in competition. See, get out of the competition. I'm not in a competition with anybody. I didn't hear your amen. No. When I started preaching this message, the first thing I did was I died to pleasing men. Before I preached this message, when I was preaching prosperity, I must buy big cars. I must have flamboyancy. I must wear suits like this. Different types, assorted. Perfumes. What if I enter with my perfume? All your own will disappear. That was in the forefront of my life. But the moment I move into this message, all those things lost relevance. The first thing was, I settled down with a helix. And I'm still using the helix still now. It's not as if I cannot buy Lexus or buy Jeep or buy whatever. I'm just happy to be inside the helix. I'm happy. I just feel peace when I enter that helix. <laughs> you don't understand. Okay. May God give you understanding. When I go to preach for my sons in ministry, immediately they see my helos, they'll just be angry. Papa, we have told you to stop this thing now. I say, if you want me to stop, bring now, enter. So when I'm going to preach for them, they will now drive jeeps and come and stop me ahead. They won't, they won't allow me to enter their town with my helos. <laughs> they will come and line up their jeeps with protocol and everything. They'll say, Baba, enter this side. I say, no, wahala. I know how to abase and I know how to abase. If you bring jet, I will enter. But I will not use my money and buy because I have to pay for TV broadcast. I have to pay for radio broadcast. There are lives I will touch. And that's my priority. I don't know if I'm talking to someone. See, once you see Jesus, your priority changes. What people are rushing for, you don't rush for anymore. You become contented. I, I, I feel like I'm preaching here. You become what? You won't buy a car to impress people when your family is hungry. Yes. Enter keke. Yes. Jump bold. Enter Uber. Nobody will know it's Uber. They don't they write them on top of the car. Uber. Cack for back as the owner. And be waving everybody left and right. <laughs> so it's like just bought a car, say before Uncle. It's kind of a difficult thing to buy. Glory to God. Glory to God. Tell your neighbor contentment. 
Bible says our contentment is in our view of God. We see God in Christ. We are contented. I'm giving somebody deliverance here. Be at peace. It is when you wake up. So which means Isaiah was assuming. Amos 3, 6. Amos Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord had not done it? Uh -uh. This Lord is doing things so. So you see, they never knew who Satan was. So everything Satan did, they blame God for. Look at 1 Samuel 24 verse 1. 1 Samuel 24 verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engidi. Did I say first? Second Samuel, sorry. Second Samuel 24 verse 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, so the anger of God made David to commit sin. Let me tell you what happened. When this census took place, 70,000 people died. Why? Because in the law of Moses, the law says before a census, you must offer a burnt offering. So David didn't offer a burnt offering. And he went into census and the law of sin and death wiped out 70,000 people. But because... In Bible days, good, bad, and evil was God. They blame God for it. And somebody said to me, but who killed David's son? When David had a child with Uriah, who killed the son? Nathan the prophet. Nathan killed David's son by applying the law of sin and death. God doesn't kill. God has never killed. God will never kill. There's no evil in God. Is it possible? Yes. Hezekiah wanted to kill. Isaiah wanted to kill Hezekiah. But Isaiah already, I mean Hezekiah already had some information. Isaiah came to Hezekiah's house and says, I'm a prophet of God. I prophesy. Put your house in order because you will die now. <laughs> Isaiah was a major prophet. Not a small prophet. Hezekiah said, be going. I have heard. But I know God enough not to be afraid. As Hezekiah is living, Isaiah said, Father, the grave cannot praise you. There's no way you can be the one sending Isaiah to kill me because you don't take glory in death. I refuse to die. God, I refuse to die. God said, Isaiah, what did you do? Isaiah, you better go and correct what you did though. Because I didn't send you. As I came back, I said, Hezekiah, God has added. <laughs> <laughs> Prophecy is not final. You can reverse it by the character of God. I'm preaching very good. Don't let people intimidate you when people say, I see. Tell them, see us that what? I see. Me too, I see now. <laughs> Say your own. Let me say my own. Praise God. Great service today. Five services in one. <laughs> I told you yesterday that today is going to be boot camp, right? Luke 9.51. I'm almost done. Don't be afraid. Luke 9.51. Remember the story? They were to go through a city and the people refused them coming through. You can read it at home, 951 to 54. And the disciples of Jesus said, shall we command fire to come down and wipe out the city? Jesus rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another city. So God cannot be involved in the destruction of lives. 
Anywhere you see destruction, it's not God. Anywhere you see evil, it's not God. Anywhere you see disaster, it's not God. God is not involved in the destruction of men's lives. Can I have a good amen? Now, that killing of 70,000 people, later on in Chronicles, we have why it happened. First Chronicles 21 verse 1. First Chronicles 21 verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So who made David number Israel? So who was responsible for the killing of the 70,000? Satan. He's a killer. He is a killer. Somebody said, what about the killing of the firstborns? Exodus 12, 11. Exodus 12, verse number 11. And thus shall you eat it with your loins guarded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Next verse. Now, watch this next verse. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I, the Lord. Next verse. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Uh -uh. You are the killer and you are the one telling them how to escape your killing. Something doesn't add up. If you are the killer, you should kill everybody now. So that means two characters are in that verse. One is killing, one is protecting. But the way it is written, it is written as if it is one character. How many of you understand? So let me ask you a question. Who is killing? Who is protecting? Good. And how did God protect? By the blood on their doorposts. How did Satan kill those who didn't have the blood? So now the question will be, how do you know that it was not God? Hebrews 12, 28. That means Hebrews eleven twenty eight. Hebrews eleven twenty eight. Can we all read together, everybody? Hebrews eleven twenty eight. Want to go through faith? He kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So, who was the destroyer of the firstborn? Satan. It will take the New Testament where the spirit of truth is to unveil the characters in the Old Testament. Satan is the destroyer. Amen? But God is good. God is the life giver. Praise the Lord. Let me close with Job. Job 121. I close with Job today. We continue in the next service. Job 121, and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job said this out of ignorance. What was Job's operation? Look at Job 1.6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now listen carefully. Every time you hear sons of God in the book of Job, he's talking about fallen angels. Fallen angels. And Satan is the chief among all the fallen angels. So this was a gathering, a fellowship of fallen angels and their master. Are you following? The sons of God and Satan came into their discussion. Why was it difficult for the writer of Job to pick out that? It was actually Satan and his angels. Because Satan and his angels are fallen angels. But they are still angels. They are fallen but they are still angels. So the writer just called them sons of God. Which means sons of God are not angels who are still maintaining their estate. Sons of God are angels that have fallen from their estate. Who are those angels? Angels that fell with Satan. How do we know? Well, write this down. You can read at home. Jude, chapter, Jude verse 6. 2 Peter 2, 4. Matthew 25, 41. 
So the writer of Job was ignorant. But now we know that Satan fellowship with fallen angels. Amen. Now why did they come before God? Job 1.5. Look at why those sons of God came before God. Is use of language. So it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of all of his children. For Job said, this is why he was doing what he was doing. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So Job was offering, offering out of fear every day. Have you come across Christians who are praying out of fear? Their prayer, eh? It a warrior. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, what are you doing? Oh Father, 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 do it again, Father. Holy Ghost, Jesus, fire, thunder, Satan. They can't even articulate their prayer because they are overtaking with fear. And you when you see them, you say prayer warrior. That brother is a prayer machine. He's praying in fear. There's no faith. He's full of fear. That sister is praying out of fear. Say, Father, whether the devil like it or not, I must marry this year. I must marry this year. Oh, Father, I must marry this year. Uh -uh. You were just talking now like you have faith, then now you are crying. It shows that you are in fear. When you pray in fear, you receive nothing. Fear denies you the ability to take what God has given. See, God is not waiting for your prayer to reach out to you. He reached out to you before you prayed. Your prayer only enables you to take what God has given. So that's why that prayer cannot be in fear. And that prayer cannot be in timidity. That prayer must be in faith. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. So once you are in fear or you are double minded, expect answers. Don't. So what do I do? If you are in fear, don't pray. Sit with the word of God. Let the word enter you and flush out fear. And you will feel the fear going. You will know that this fear has gone. Are we teaching? Many people tell me in Power City, since I started following your teachings, Papa, fear is gone. Because what teaching does is teaching brings fear out and establishes your identity in Christ. If it is true, can I have a good amen? amen. Get rid of fear. And you know, there's general fear and there are specific fears. When you have fear that you may lose your job, that's a fear to deal with. No, you're not living in fear. But there are specific areas of your life where there is fear. When you're afraid that you may lose something, you may lose someone, you may... That, those fears, you have to deal with it because it's not God. God has not given to us. But of love. And of a sound mind. So if there is fear in any area of your life, who is behind it? So now the question is this. Papa, why did I pray for that brother? I stood in faith. He too was agreeing with me that he will not die and yet he died. You think he agreed because he was saying amen but inside him either he made up his mind to die or fear finished him and then he goes. Then you conclude that God didn't answer your prayer. You can pray for people, but you don't have a right to decide whether they receive the answer or not. Are we teaching? See, he says, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He didn't say you shall lay hands on the sick and recover them. You didn't get that? So when we pray for the sick, it is the responsibility of the sick to recover. My job is to pray. Receive. You say, Amen. Receive. Amen. Next. If he dies, glory to God. Next. It means he didn't receive. 
or he had a belief system in his mind that my prayer could not correct. You understand? There are people with belief systems in their mind. See, that's why the greatest favor a man can do for you is to teach you the word of God accurately. A belief system. So you are praying, they are saying amen, but inside them, they are not in agreement. Do you understand? And it's not God. It's within man. It's not God. I've prayed for people who died. I've prayed for people who died. And I've raised the dead. I've raised the dead. I've prayed for people who died. I've prayed for people with blind eyes and their eyes opened. And I've prayed for people with blind eyes, their eyes didn't open. I've prayed for deaf and dumb and the ears pop open and their tongues got loose. And I've prayed for people with deaf and dumb conditions that didn't get healed. I've gone to a psychiatric hospital, preached and prayed for everybody, and by the following week, all of them were discharged. When they brought a new consignment, the doctors did not allow me entrance. They said, I spoiled business last time. I cannot enter this. And I've also prayed for a psychiatric woman who died in my hands. She never got healed. It's not my fault. I do my part to pray. You do your part to receive. But if I pray for you and I observe you are in fear, I stop the prayer. I sit you down. I take the word of God and flush you out first. And sometimes while I'm detoxing, you get healed. How many of you understand what we're talking about? See, it's not, we are not in a showmanship. We are, we are walking with God. You've got to receive in faith. Some say, I'm believing God for a job. Jobs are everywhere. And if you listen, the spirit of God will tell you where to go. He will tell you where to go. The reason why you don't know where to go is because you're not listening. When you pray, you listen. Don't just pray. When you pray like that, you're not listening. If you want to pray in a way, you can listen. Thank you. You are expecting to hear. So you will hear. Boys, you are not expecting. So no wahala. Pray and go. If I come to you now and I say, I don't like the way you behave. I don't like what you do. Don't do that next time. All right, see you. I will not get your response. But if I come to you and I say, I don't like the way you behave. This is what you did. And I don't understand why. And I wait. You will answer me. I will hear you. We come to God in prayer. We come in the place of fellowship with God. And we do all the talking. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bye bye. God is trying to say, wait now. <laughs> Let me talk to you now. God is say, okay, no problem. You go. You go and jump rock. Brah! God, where are you? I will be here where I have been now. So I was ready to tell you. <laughs> Praise God. Then Job now said, the things that I feared has come upon me. So it wasn't God, it was Job's fear. Do you understand? Even when Satan was saying, oh God, you protected Job, that's why we can't reach him. So even Satan was ignorant of what he had. God said, ah, me protect Job. Oh, no, I didn't protect Job. Bro. He has been there like that in your hand all this while. Uh, then Satan realized, eh, hey, so it's in my hand. Yes, it's in your hand. Because once a man is in fear, it's in Satan's hand. Say with me, no fear here. No Say it one more time. Are you blessed this afternoon? Say it again, no fear here. Say with me, in the name of Jesus. God is a good God. He's thinking well of me. His thoughts are good towards me. And my thoughts are good towards him. So I receive from the goodness of God. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Stand on your feet, let me close this service. 
Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Overfed, right? Because the way some of you are standing up, it's like you ate for many days. I'm giving you plenty so that when you meet on Wednesday in the clusters, you have enough to chew on. The thing will be coming from every side, woto, woto. Praise God. Abuja, listen carefully. We will shake this city. Ah, the way you're shouting, amen. I said, we will shake this city. Religion will leave this place for us. I didn't hear your amen. Men that are bound will come to the light. Men that the devil has already taken captive will be totally liberated. Through your ministry, through your teaching, through your preaching, through your advancing of the kingdom in your office, in your neighborhood, where you live, men will come to the knowledge of the truth. I didn't hear that, amen. I'd like you to lift your hands and just give God thanks for being good to you. Thank him for all of his faithfulness and grace. And I want to hear you pray like people that are born of the spirit. Pray like a man and a woman born of the spirit. Mendo Zekila the Babro da Berege de Zekele de Boya. I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. I'm led by the Spirit. I walk in the Spirit. I walk in the light. I have no occasion of stumbling. I have no occasion of stumbling. Darkness does not function where I am. Bronda goes up in the dark, the ladder bore rock or two, the Kalana Mazekele de Bobos. Hey! Thank you, Father, for the light of your world. In the name of Jesus. Can I hear that amen like thunder? Lift your right hand and just lift your right hand and I want to be hearing your amens as I declare God's word. I decree right now whatever area of your life the devil has been inching in, we put a stop to that area. Amen. Satan, out of that place. Out of that business. Out of that career. Out of that marriage. Out, out, out. In the name of Jesus. Out of that body. Sickness and disease dissolve. Melt and be flushed out. Body be healed. Be healed. Be healed. And I declare that as you leave this conference today, wherever you step into, favor is calling your name. Favor is working for you. Receive clarity. Receive direction. Receive solution. Receive ideas. Receive answers. In the name of Jesus. Barriers are terminated. Obstacles are terminated. Above all, I decree that the revelation of God's word grows big in your heart until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus, you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I call you fruitful. You are fruitful. You are fruitful. In the name of Jesus, I decree that through you souls are saved. Men are coming to the light. Darkness has no hold around you. Our campuses grow stronger. I decree that the gospel in this land thrives stronger. So mightily grow the world in this land and prevails. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Oh, we give you praise. Oh, we give you praise. I decree that this week will be a harvest of victories. Victories on every side. Hey, Kamana, Hulada, Galaga, Jokola. That worry is terminated. Anxiety, go. Fear, go. In the name of Jesus. You will not die that attack of the devil on your mind ends now. Amen. Torment ceases. Amen. That torment ceases. Amen. That torment ceases. Amen. The voice of the devil is silenced. Amen. Now walk in victory. Amen. Walk in victory. Amen. Walk in victory. Amen. What was closing up has opened up for you. Amen. There's an opening for you. I decree that this week you will rejoice like never before. God's grace is mighty upon you. In Jesus' precious name. And if you believe it, let there be a rejoicing in this house. Glory to God. Glory to God. Somebody shout yes. 
Now listen to me. We are getting ready to close in a few minutes. Today is partnership service. And like I always do back home, we take time to pray for partners. We talked about it in the first service. And uh, we took the partnership. But I would like to pray for all the partners in this service. In a few minutes, I will do that. But before I pray for partners, I want to take up your honor offerings. We give in honor of God's word. And we give in faith. We give with joy. We give knowing that our giving does a lot of good for the kingdom of God. I will not keep my resources away from God. There is nothing I have that I did not receive. Always an honor and a joy for me to give for the work of God. I live to advance the kingdom of God. Amen. I said amen. Can somebody say that with me? I live to advance the kingdom of God. Lift up your honor offerings. Father, I pray that as we honor your word and give in faith right now. Everyone giving our offering is a sweet smell before you today. And we rejoice for the privilege to give in Jesus' name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. All right, praise guys. Let's go. Hit the music. Let's do it. Any basket closest to where you are, you will just go drop your, 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 your honor offerings and let's celebrate the risen Lord. Praise God. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. Say you have rescued. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm, and I'm never going back oh you have rescued you have rescued my life you have rescued my life you have rescued my life and i'm never and i'm never and i'm never oh you have rescued you have rescued my life you have rescued my life you have rescued my life You wouldn't light up mountain, you wouldn't climb up coming after me. No one you wouldn't kick down, now you wouldn't tee down coming after me. No shadow you wouldn't light up, no shadow you wouldn't light up mountain, you wouldn't climb up coming after me. No one you wouldn't kick down, no one you wouldn't kick down, no one you wouldn't tee down. No shadow you won't light up. No shadow you won't light up. No one you won't climb up. Coming after me. No one you won't kick down. No one you won't kick down. No one you won't run down. Coming after me. No shadow you won't light up. No shadow you won't light up. No one you won't climb up. Coming after me. No one you won't. Please still stand with me. I want to pray for all partners. Every month we take time to do that back home. We do that back home for all partners in Power City, not just in Uyo, all over the world. And since I'm not back home, I'm here. I want to do that here today. So all of you partner with us every month in this ministry. Whether you came with your partnership here or you've redeemed it in the banks or you plan to do it within the week, I'd like you to come forward. We want to pray for you, honey. Please come. Let's pray for all the partners. We pray for all of you in this house and we use you as a point of contact to pray for all partners around the world in all power city campuses everywhere in the world today. As people give and support the work that we do globally, we want to just pray for all partners. You're a partner or you've not been a partner before because you didn't know about it, but you, you've just made up your mind to partner with us. Partnership is an opportunity for you to support what we do globally because there's so much we need to do. You know, the gospel of falsehood has gained so much grounds and the gospel of falsehood has a lot of sponsors. 
they've gained grounds they have a lot of sponsors so they can afford to be on major networks misleading more people i hope you understand what i'm saying but we too god has people and god has their treasures we too god is raising people who are understanding the true gospel so we can get the word out there for more people to hear the truth and have the opportunity to decide whether to go with the truth or with falsehood and as you continue to partner with us through your partnership we're able to get this gospel everywhere campuses are springing up every day people are coming into power city who have walked out of darkness into the light into the light i come across a lot of general overseers of churches who thank me for what we teach through our teachings they too are able to make corrections in their denominations and it's an honor to do this for jesus and we're able to do this because all of you are part of it with your givings with your prayer and with your support every time you give to us continually every month and some of you even do not you don't wait for the month you just give partnership as the money's come we want you to know that you are not investing in a system that fails you are laying up treasure in heaven where thieves cannot break through or steal can i have a good amen, amen. so we like to pray for you just open your two hands towards us and father we stand in faith today to pray for all partners partners of power city right here in this campus partners of power city in all our campuses right in uyo partners of power city online those that are yet to find a campus to belong who always send monies to support what we do globally lord specifically today i pray over every partner here i decree that you are enriched in all things i decree that you lack nothing i declare that the enemy has no hold over you i decree that your health is strong you have no sickness nor disease coming near your dwelling in the name of jesus you are established in righteousness you are far from oppression and in the name of jesus the work of your hands are blessed receive ideas receive concepts receive insights and in the name of jesus receive opportunities receive opportunities the favor of god is at work on your behalf and in the name of jesus you walk in the light we decree that your, your steps are ordered you know where to do to go you you know where not to go and you know the right timing to go to places in the name of jesus and we decree that the remaining days of this month you will do great business you will make much money and in the name of jesus together we will get this gospel to flood the earth as the water covers the sea great grace is upon you your family is kept your children are kept and we decree above all that you continue to enjoy the goodness of god in the land of the living great grace is upon you in jesus precious name and every partner says a powerful amen, amen. glory to god glory. once again thank you for partnering with us if you have yours here you can just drop it in the baskets but if not do it in the banks like we've always done and thank you again for giving today praise god hallelujah hallelujah all right we will take the worship general offerings go 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 ahead go go it's yours stand with us stand with us stand with us don't be tired amen amen, amen. hallelujah amen. so we're here to um take the general offering uh we know that the general offering we usually use it for our local assembly so for power city abuja um, we use it for running the church making sure that everyone is comfortable and everyone is taken care of so um, it's to support our local assembly um, so if you have your general offering so please come forward and give it amen, amen. <laughs> Oh, you people! Oh, you people! 
let's get busy. Pastor Matthew is going to tell us the plan on how we're going to function the next two weeks to get more people to get this truth. And let me also mention this. I already started talking to somebody after the first service today about us being on radio every day. Now, in order for us to be on radio, please listen very carefully. I need some of you here to help me pay for the radio broadcast. And we are more than able. Are we more than able? Can we do it? We can do it. I need some of you. Make sure you enjoy your week. Enjoy the week without apology. But don't enjoy and forget the work. So enjoy and do the work. And we look forward to a lot of testimonies coming in from the house. And uh, just listen to Pastor Matthew on the things he will have us do.